Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice. Giving you a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Stand Up Paddleboarding has exploded in popularity in recent years and offers many great health benefits while enjoying life outdoors. Today, Gray sits down with an expert on the matter, Brody Welty. Brody founded PaddleFit in 2008 and is a gold-winning coach with Team USA. He's worked with numerous pro and non-professional athletes over the years and has created a global, respected paddle coaching system and culture. On the show, they cover how the definition of fitness has evolved over the years, the importance of breathing and movement, why stand-up paddling is a great cross-training activity, and some tips and benefits on getting into paddleboarding and water sports. So let's get going with this episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. You're hearing me open because Lee Burton's not here, and that's by design. I've got a great friend on the show today, Brody Welty, and we connected over paddle sports, uh, a waterman culture. And I was very envious in, in my early paddling exposure to stand up paddling where he got to work with Yolo Board. It's like the coolest company on the East Coast with all these lifestyle commercials shot in these great settings. And all of a sudden they had this uh, paddle fit consultant, Brody Welty. He was talking a bunch of functional stuff. I loved the fact that 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 company selling uh, water products was actually involving somebody that knew a little bit about exercise and conditioning. And then I got to know Brody and found out that his degree wasn't in sports medicine, exercise science, mm-hmm. exercise physiology, kinesiology. This guy's a wildlife biologist, but uh, from Michigan. And I'm like, so how does a guy from there get into surf culture and then take what he knew about the basics of biology and, and really stand out? where everybody else is just trying to paddle faster and upgrade products. And this guy's actually unpacking paddling, both for lifestyle and high performance in a great way. So without further ado, Brody Welty. Oh, thank you, Gray. That was a great introduction. Uh, I'm going to take it a step further. Uh, Growing up in Michigan, a lot of people here, you know, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. Michigan has actually 11,000. And I grew up in the only county in Michigan that didn't have a natural lake. So the irony goes way deeper (laughs) of me getting involved in the surf culture. And I didn't even have a natural body of water in the county that I grew up in. So the irony goes real deep with me for sure. That is crazy. Well, well, I'll give you a quick history lesson. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on Netflix, the last dance about the Chicago Bulls. Oh, Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. When my when my oldest daughter saw that, I couldn't wait to tell her because shameless plug for dad. I got to be there. Al Vermeil was a strength coach at the time during really? the last dance. Got very interested in the movement screen. He's the only strength coach in the um, in the pros that has rings from three different sports: baseball, football, basketball. Wow! And he had flown me in a couple of times to work with the Bulls, just seeing how much of screening we could do in that culture. But while I was there. I checked on a flight across the lake to Lansing, Michigan, where an 80-year-old guy lived named Verlin Kruger, who was one of the most accomplished paddlers of all time. Um, in as far as like long distance, uh, he'd gone from yeah. I think the Bering Sea to Cape Horn on a canoe. And I just yeah. reached out to him one day because I had one of the boats that he designed and asked, could I come visit him? So I went right from the bulls to this guy. And, and got to spend the night at his house. And this guy's got like Guinness World Book of Records. And I was more giddy about meeting him than I was working oh, with yeah. Bulls. Now, don't, the Bulls was a feather in my cap, but I got to paddle with that guy. And I still think he's got records that, that haven't been challenged. So that was my, we paddled upstream and I was paddling with a 70 or 80 year old guy. And I just kept looking over saying, this is a pretty good pace. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Oh yeah. They have, there's a huge marathon canoe race in Northern Michigan, it's world famous. I mean, they've got people from all over the planet. I can't remember the name of it, but like Jimmy Terrell, who um, owns and runs quick blade, he's been in that. I mean, they, there's a huge paddling community in Michigan that predates any type of stand up paddling stuff. 
No, I um, love so I love the Voyager cool stories and and stuff like yep. that. And and uh, I got to meet Terrell one day. I, I like the way that guy unpacks paddling. Yeah, I really he, do. you would get along with Jimmy. Really, good. he's an awesome guy. He's a you know cerebral cerebral guy. He he puts a lot of thought into all that he does. So yeah, I got to connect you guys for sure. Well, let me start. You're growing up in Michigan. You don't have as many lakes as all the other kids do in your county. <laughs> you get into wildlife biology. And I'm asking you that so I can ask you another question, but at least get me what got you there. So interesting enough, I was a uh, pre-engineer major. Let me take a step back. I played all traditional sports. So in Michigan, we didn't even have a soccer team. So it was meat and potatoes, and it was football, basketball, baseball, track. That's all you did. That's all they offered. So I was a fairly decent high school athlete. I was an all-state track runner, sprinter, long jumper. I uh, was an all-state football player as well, and actually had uh, grew up a huge Michigan State fan, really wanted to play football for Michigan State, had an opportunity with George Perlis, who was the coach uh, my senior year. He was a coach at Michigan State my senior year in high school, and then he gets canned during the summer, and um, a guy that you might recognize and the, the world might recognize named Nick Saban became the head coach at Michigan state. And he, not only did he not have any clue who I was, probably didn't want anything to do with me. So I had kind of a existential crisis early on, tried to walk on, end up not working out right away. I mean, I, di- I didn't even make it to a practice, went to a few meetings. And then I settled into, I was actually a pre-engineer major. So I went through all the calculus, all the physics, all the chemistry, sat in my first thermodynamics class, and I looked around. I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> so I had this is where the irony starts again. I narrowed it down to kinesiology, sports medicine, and wildlife biology. Okay. Those were the two paths that – and I'm like, I, I just love being outdoors. I can't picture myself in a lab, in, in a you know indoors, whatever. So I took the path of wildlife biology and ended up getting a degree from there and, and um, you know, really kind of set me on a path of working outdoors. I didn't know it was going to take me completely full circle in the direction that I'm in now, um, but that was kind of the weird path that I took to get my degree in wildlife biology. Well, you know, I honestly think if you've got a background in wildlife biology and you sort of reframe the pandemic that just happened, it helps you look at it in a different way. And if it's not obvious where I'm going, nowhere in wildlife biology can you define an organism without also defining, defining the environment that it's in. And there's an irony here. We are the only species on the planet that got to define if we're fit or not. Every other species on the planet, its fitness is defined by its environment. You know, if you, if you ask a squirrel, are you fit for winter? Uh, it can't answer that, but the question will get answered in the spring. Cause you're either going to find a pile of bones or you're going <laughs> to find a squirrel that made it through the winter. And it's, it's ironic that the word physical was always used in front of the word fitness right up until the fifties. And then all of a sudden, fitness just became its own word like we know what that is. But everybody get, gets to define fitness. And there's two spikes in, in our use of the word physical fit. Um, and it's a graph. And the first one is 1918, and the next one's 1942. And then fitness drops back off again. But when you're in a world war with uh, other humans, it's really easy to find out, are we fit enough to win this thing or not? Because there is a physical element in battle and in war that cannot be denied. And sports really are just practice for the next time of turmoil. And it's nice to have a little bit of a competitive advantage. And if you're a little bit healthier than your opponent, whether it be in a game or a battle, it's good. And it's funny how when we're really hard pressed to define fitness, We've got to get tight on that. And we did in 1918 and we did in 1942. But yet, you know, we also have people, you know, making shows like they used to make like the biggest loser that get to define what fitness is. And I don't think that's right because 
if you're in a toxic environment, then there's no reason an organism should flourish. And so if we can't question the environment, why are we only trying to influence fitness parameters? So philosophically speaking, no biologist would ever study an organism without taking environmental samples too. And we assign exercises to humans all the time without ever asking, is there an upstream toxicity to your lifestyle? And if it is, there's not enough exercise or corrective maneuvers on the planet to make you fit for anything other than the sedentary lifestyle that, that you've become accustomed to. We're going to make you comfortable, but fitness and comfort rarely go hand in hand because adaptation is never a comfortable process. It doesn't have to be painful, but it's going to be uncomfortable. And we're avoiding that at all costs in every aspect of our life these days. And so I think you, believe it or not, have a wisdom in your approach to both paddle sports and general athletics that a lot of people forget. The organism defines the environment. <laughs> so, Yeah. And, and just think about, you know, you bring up a, a bunch of good points, but think about the advice that we get or give as a human performance specialist, even a physician, you know, the doctor's like, mm, you need to lose a little bit of weight. You need to do, you know, without taking into any, in consideration any of their environment. You know, one of the cool studies that I was a part of, and this was, you know, we're going back 20 years now, is we did a um, migration study of the white-tailed deer. And it, it was fascinating to me that basically 10 and a half, 11 months out of the year, those deer stayed in the same half mile radius. Well, one, you know, six weeks out of the year, where do you, what do you think happens? What happens for six weeks out of every year? <laughs> Hunting season. And those deer scatter. They go all over. You know, the stress is increased. Their home range is being invaded. So, you know, we had to take a look at everything when we did that study and go, okay, what are the external pressures? What are the internal pressures? What does the food look like? What is, and you know, to be honest, as I transitioned my career into human performance, I took that same approach. You know, if I had, you know, I, I worked with a, a pro athlete named Candace Appleby, who was a world champ in, in stand up paddling. And she was a first beast, working, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, and I, I honestly, my first interaction with her, I'm like, I can't bring anything physical for her. She's far, she's far superior to any other paddler from a physical standpoint. So then I had to start looking at, you know, what happened a year ago? Why did she drop off? Why did, so I had to look in the periphery of her other parts of her life to then develop a plan that would get her on the right path going that way. So that honestly, you hit the nail on the head. My experience as a biologist, even though it was, it was only for a handful of years and limited, it trained me to look at everything. You just can't like, why is this person not? doing the, this exercise that I prescribed to them, or, you know, why is this person not adhering to the diet plan that their dietitian gave to them? You, you can't, it's not black and white. It's what is happening in the periphery. What are other external forces? You know, is someone going through a hunting season, you know, in their life? Are they going through a divorce? Are they moved? Have they moved? Have they, did they go through a two year pandemic that we just went through that changed my life? I know talking to you, it changed your life. Yeah. So you know, approaching it from a biologist standpoint where you're trying to look at every possible factor uh, really helped me in my career as a human performance specialist, for sure. No, you, you actually reminded me of the experience that Lee and I had when we were asked by David Ledbetter, Michelle Wee's uh, golf coach, swing coach, to take a look at her and give a second opinion. She was having a lot of physical issues. And Lee and I, you know, I mean, there's 10,000 people that could have given her core exercises. And, and yeah. I, I realized that since there were that many people that could do that, they probably already tried. They were unsuccessful. So the last thing I need to show up with is my exercise playbook. We found uh, some serious nutritional problems. Not that she was eating bad. She was actually having some food intolerances and, and one food allergy. Right. And, and then on the other side of it, there were four different ways she could execute the golf swing. I wasn't about to talk about golf swing mechanics to David Ledbetter. I mean, that's, that's his right. wheelhouse. Right. However, I did have enough background in her movement signature and her health problems to say three of these swings are probably not going to leave her as healthy as this right. one. 
So of all four of her swing paths or swing style she could have, the most durable and sustainable one is this. Do with that what you will. So I wasn't a nutritionist and I'm not a golf swing coach, but I realized these musculoskeletal problems had an upstream influence in in her diet and her travel schedule. And we needed to get control of that because if, if most of musculoskeletal is managing inflammation, then we've got to agree that a lot of things can cause that other than stress, trauma, and exercise. Cortisol can cause that. Sleep deprivation, dehydration, and, and food intolerances can cause that. And secondly, sports aren't good for you. They're, they're good for you right. culturally and psychologically and socially, but most of the time, sports aren't a full diet of movement. They're a myopic approach to movement. You're a marathoner. You're a tennis player. You're a golfer. Especially golf. Golf, I mean, that's... You have asymmetrical, full unloading every single, you know, how many, probably 72 times at least. Yeah. And, and, you know, most people avoid running because they say, you know, the impact's going to light up my back. There's more impact on your back in a golf swing than there is a jog around the neighborhood on a concrete sidewalk. You just don't realize it because you got to think 3D. But Michelle Wee was that Candace Appleby. She was that tall, well-muscled looked great and had all the potential in the world. But even that person in a toxic environment with a skill adjustment breaks down. And and I'm glad that like you, we didn't assume that we were just there to rejigger the exercise program. We were there to be holistic in our approach of stress management and recovery management, you know? Yeah. Well, and back to my dear example, the whole goal of studying these deer was, you know, Michigan's number one revenue generator for recreation is hunting. So if, if the populations are decimated, they're losing one of their biggest tax revenues that helps facilitate state parks and all these other great, um, you know, kayaking and, and it even tied into what I do now with stand up paddling. It's amazing how far that reach is. So if you have something screwed up, you have to go in there and go, okay, you know what? These deer were doing this. We're going to point to, okay, hunting pressures here. You have to be able to point to other, you know, other areas that are not in your expertise, but at the same time, be able to steer that athlete. You know, like the Michelle Wee example is, is a great example. You knew what's going on. You're like, yeah, I could run her through a screen. She's probably going to score 15. And, but I'm telling you right now, she has, you know, she's allergic to X, Y, Z in her diet. You guys need to go find someone that's going to help her get her diet dialed in. Yeah. So I think as a biologist, you have to be able to look at everything and go, yeah, you know what? You need to go see someone over here because they're going to help you more than I can. And, it, you know, it's the same way with human performance. You, you know, you got to be able to drop the ego at the door and go, I can't help this person, but I know all the, the signs are pointing to X, Y, Z. You need to go see this person. That's, that's, a, that's a great point. And in, in the other podcast, Lee and I were just unpacking my new book. And some of the things that I try to talk about are we're actually pre-screening. And I know that there's a, some people out there shrugging saying, first, these guys made a screen before we exercise. Now we got a pre-screen before we screen. We're not pre-screening movement. We're pre-screening environmental red flags that are getting ready to tell you exercise isn't the only problem here. And, you know, I think making that reference back to, you know, 1918 and the early 1940s, we had a lot more young men fit to serve in the military in both those unfortunate time spans than we currently do. And so there was a time, I think, that you could just get after it. And most of the time, you wouldn't break yourself. You would just get stronger as you go. You would learn. And I think that time may have passed for a little while. And we've eaten off a bad food pyramid. We've sat a little bit too long and we've watched sports. And I honestly think we, we think we participate. I mean, literally I went to see the new Maverick movie. And for a while there, I was thinking, Hey, I'm an old guy and I'm a pilot and you know, I can, I can do what Maverick does. I mean, we were spectators far more than we're doers right now. And we just got to shake ourselves out of that. We got to put on a backpack and go for a hike 
not go for a jog immediately if you haven't had impact in five years. We've got to do stuff like that. But I do think that those of us in the profession don't need to keep saying this upstream, downstream narrative. Just screen the domains that are getting ready to poison the outcome of the effort you're getting ready to do. So I wish I could just be a strength coach. But half the time I'm trying to be a strength coach, I got to be a physical therapist. I wish I could just be a physical therapist. But as soon as I finish, if I don't give good lifestyle and exercise advice, they're going to be right back in. So I think we don't have to become nutritionists, sleep experts, and skill experts. Even though you are a fitness expert and a paddling coach, I know a lot of guys who are fitness experts and golf coaches. It's nice when we can wear two hats, but most people who don't wear two hats can still get a network, create that village, and you can be a full service very, very easy. But I know what kind of diets are your minimum. I know what kind of sleep is your minimum. I know what kind of breathing screens are your minimum. That's all I'm looking for. Because one of those is going to take this out no matter how many, much I get your sets and reps and exercise path right. Yeah, and I think if you look at the human species, we've done everything we possibly could to make our lives miserable. Like <laughs> every possible thing. Ruining our environment. We are l- living more sedentary. You know, We're doing everything you could possibly do wrong. So it's fascinating that you know, if you look at the kind of the trajectory, some of the dates that you were talking about of physical fitness, you know, at one time, very few people were obese or overweight. So, you know, you were talking in generalities. And then, you know, as sport got involved and you got people making millions and millions of dollars, and I know you've worked with a ton of pro athletes. I've worked with a lot of people in the adventure action sports arena. You know, you, then, you, then you're almost feel like you're forced to specialize. Well, now that we've ruined our species so much, we have to be generalists. We have to be able to have foundational knowledge about sleep, foundational knowledge about nutrition, foundational knowledge is about movement. You know, the more we specialize, it works great with pro athletes, but the general population, it's, it's ruining people. We're not helping. If you're an extreme specialist, you're not helping people, the general population, because they're, we're so far gone as a species that we have to get back to just the simple fundamental. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm working on right now is breathing. You know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, did we have a conversation about breathing? No, but I've noticed that my breathing through the tension of the pandemic and all the anxiety that's been infused into us as a population, you have to go back and you have to go to the fundamentals of breathing. Otherwise, you're going to continue to get sicker and sicker. You know, it's, it's amazing the shifts that we've gone through, you know, even in the last two years. I don't mind unpacking this with you and myself because I don't want anybody listening to this to think we're not vulnerable. And whenever the FMS screen team is on the road and we're teaching and we're doing stuff, don't think we're not in the Marriott on the fifth floor, like working. <laughs> I got needles right. in my neck. I'm adjusting yeah. somebody's ankle. We got to take care of each other. And When I came out of my neck surgery, which was a two-level fusion, I either had to go upstairs in the rehab clinic and do this for public consumption and have people ask me questions while I'm just trying to rehab myself. I just had to go up to the cabin and I had to do some cold plunges and I had to do some carries and I had to do some tall kneeling turns. And the very first thing that hit me was after being in chronic pain for six years, not doing what I was supposed to do about it, not following my own advice, not doing what my colleagues told me to do, I had altered my breathing to brace myself against the world because everything I did, I calculated, is this worth it? And when I got to the point of, is it worth it to pick up my three-year-old daughter and take this ping of pain? I had to come to Jesus talk with myself and Rose had to come to Jesus talk with me and said, you ready to get that neck fusion now? And I felt like that was admitting I was a failure by not being able to avoid surgery myself when really that's exactly what I had gritted myself into. I had survived six years past where I would have recommended most people to get a fusion. And I I realized the last contact me and you had, I was was down there um, toward uh, your area and you, you said you're having some back pain. And one of the very first thing we unpack is just reversing your breathing pattern, yeah. you know, in, in a simple movement. And there's, there's no dishonor in that. You're not 
you're not supposed to be able to see your own blind spot. I mean, that's why they call it a blind spot. That's why we have buddies and friends and professionals. And whether you referred yourself or whether I just stuck my nose in your business, there was a, there was a teaching moment there that somebody had taught me. And resyncing your breathing and movement is the quickest way to dip your toe in a mind-body connection that you've divorced yourself from. Because we brace for a hit. But if you're getting 46 hits a day, you're, you weren't made to brace that much, right? You, you need some hammock yeah, time. No, you need some family time. <laughs> yeah. It, well, and it's fast. I mean, you, it's fascinating where I look at when I was a biologist and made that transition to human performance. Um, you know, I came from the bodybuilding background. I mean, that's what I did through sports is, you know, what are you doing to back and buys, you know, you know, tr- chest and tries you know, that bodybuilding mentality that Arnold Schwarzenegger gave all of us through, what was that movie? Pumped. Oh my you know, God. That, 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 that movie pumped. Um, I've got a funny side story that maybe we'll tell later about uh, me asking never to present again at idea, um, <laughs> which that's a whole nother side topic, but it's funny back to my lower back issue. You know, even the, the, the evolution that I've gone through personally over the last 10 years through being exposed to people like you, Mark Verstegen, you know, what, what did we use to correct my issue? We used breathing in Indian clubs. Like if you would have told me 15 years ago, um, Hey Brody, you know, 15 years from now, your lower back's going to be on fire for two, three years. And we're going to use some deep breathing. We're going to use some breathing patterns and we're going to use Indian clubs. I would have been like, you are crazy out of your mind, but my back is 50% better by the prescription that you gave me through Indian clubs, which I've played around with them before, but using them in the pattern that, that you had prescribed and changing and focusing on my breathing has completely changed my lower back. I haven't even touched my lower back as far as chiropractic therapy or any manipulation, even, you know, doing some, uh, you know, uh, foam rolling or any of that type of stuff, soft tissue stuff. I haven't touched any of that. I've worked on Indian clubs and I've worked on my breathing and my back is 50% better. If that's not an indication of being aware of your surroundings, taking a holistic approach to human performance, I don't know what is. No, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because the one example that I think resonates with, with so many professionals and non-professionals is everybody likes a clean car. Whether you keep it clean or whether you right. pay somebody to keep it clean, there's a great day when you're driving a clean car on a road trip. I mean, when I'm living around town here in Chatham, my vehicles get a little bit junked up. I I hate to say it, but when I take a road trip, I like a clean vehicle, like the tires done, I'm going to get it dirty and I'm going to go on another adventure, but I like to, I like to travel in a clean car. And if you can imagine the way these big car washes run, all the detail guys are on the other end of the general car wash. They run the car through a general wash and I think most of us, when we have a problem, we go right for the detail. We want to see the orthopedic surgeon, the neurologist. And and I do think right now, if I were to do a a thorough musculoskeletal exam on you, we could get right to the source so quick of maybe one sticking point that a little bit of local or detail therapy could unburden for you, you know, but at the same time, the fact that you've already got your limits of stability and all your other stuff worked out and the Indian clubs are literally to distract you, uh, and make you breathe and step and move without that brace and, and taking that park and break off. And that's what I try to do. So much of what the world needs right now is just a little general movement hygiene and if anything is still burdening you on the other side of that general movement wash, we got that. But too many right. people are bringing a physical therapy detailed examination to somebody that's lit up from head to toe. There ain't enough therapy or you know reimbursement from insurance to get all that right. And you had the guts to do it. You had the guts to take a leap of faith. And nothing we did that day put you in deeper pain meaning we ran a few tracers and demonstrated we could dump tension. And so many people use exercise to create stress and burden. But 
truly corrective exercise or therapeutic exercise is done to get you healthier. And if it's used as a medicine, it should be dosed as a medicine. And, and it warms my heart to hear you say that because I could be wrong. 20% of the time, I'm usually wrong in that general wash. Sometimes people do need me to go right in and free up that segment. But um, no, I'm, I, I embrace that. And some of those techniques I did with you, I literally, before I went for my neck surgery, I had about two months before I flew out to the West Coast and, and had this pretty extensive surgery. And I was doing stuff that probably wouldn't be medically recommended, seeing how many of our corrective techniques would light me up in this delicate condition. I considered myself a very good tuning fork, right? If I'm doing this, if I don't do this right, it's going to make me worse. But if I do it right, maybe I'll go into surgery a little bit better, um, a little bit more self-aware, and maybe I will have laid out what I need to do on my road to recovery after surgery. Same thing for you. You may need to have a touch with a chiropractor or a therapist, but you're not dreading tomorrow morning now. And, and it can right. be, it's not this desperation so I can continue working. It's now, I need to work a full head to toe exam into my schedule sometime in the next month. But yet your body can get you through the day now. And I think most people need to recognize it like that. Asking for a specialist when, when you need a good general musculoskeletal wash is going to get you exactly what you're looking for, a really big bill and a myopic isolation approach to, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even when you talk about the general wash, and I don't know if this is the motivation by the pre-screening that you guys are, are that you're talking about, you know, before the full FMS screen or FCS or whatever other screen you're referring to, um, how do you affect change? You affect change by helping people get aware, become aware of their environment, their own body, however it is, their own breathing. You know, the general wash, what that did for me is, you know, I've been in a funk over the, um, the pandemic. You know, when you have your business taken away from you because you can't travel, you have a lot of stuff taken away, it, it de- you know, it's a huge detriment to you. So what the general wash that you're talking about did for me is it, be, it helped me become aware again. And it's like, oh, yeah. Okay, you know, now I, I can watch what I eat a little bit better. Now I can, oh, I know that this is going to light my back up. I got to be careful around that. You know, let's let's go, you know, continue the healing process before we start doing that. Um, I wonder if the pre-screening that you're talking about, prescribing a general wash to everybody on the planet, I wonder what type of impact that would have on people's health, people's longevity, you know, people's quality of life, you know, that goes back to my conversation about being a generalist. You know, what happens if we talk to people about sleep, hydration, breathing? What if, those, what if we just talk to about those three things? What kind of impact do you think we would have on people's general health and well-being? Or at least them becoming aware of, hey, this isn't good for me. This is good for me. I need to buy into my own health and wellness. Well, I honestly think most people if they did that in an organized and objective way, okay? Right. Meaning the reason I say pre-screen is you don't get to tell me about your sleep. I get to ask right. you a few questions about your sleep. You don't get to tell me about your movement. I get to screen that and, uh, you know, and, and you don't get to tell me about your breathing. I get to test your breathing. But on the other side of that, there is a mind-body connect or disconnect. Your subjective awareness doesn't align with what I just measured. That means the first adjustment we make isn't on your back. It's on your perspective. Right. Uh, right. I mean, you can't change people's behavior by recommending another behavior in place of it. You change people's behavior by changing their perspective or their perception. Right. And that's why, you know, you see a high school and unfortunately, instead of these posters that say drunk driving is dumb, you don't see that anymore. Right. They just take a car that somebody died in that's right. crushed like a sardine can and they park it right there next to the, the sign that says prom next week. And then everybody's like, yeah, right. Yeah. We, I, 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 I needed to, I probably needed to see that because last weekend right. we got a little out of hand. So it's whatever you do to, to drive that awareness. But I honestly think to back to what you said, if you do those general 
lifestyle hygiene. The first thing you see when you're trying to sleep better is what sleep hygiene all about. It's about all the right. don'ts, not all the do's, right? Yeah, it'd be great if we could all have the cooling mattress and the stuff like that. But right, the don'ts right. are, if you're watching TV at 10 o'clock, there's a good chance you're going to be watching TV at 1130. <laughs> right. So, yeah, if you're staring at your screen at 930, you're going to be staring at your screen at 1030. Exactly, exactly. So Scrolling, so, doing whatever. I honestly think that a lot of people would either find out they don't need musculoskeletal rehabilitation or they will go into rehabilitation far better. Just like if most physicians would consider a little bout of therapy or rehab or chiropractic prior to surgery, you may not avoid surgery, but you go into it already knowing the path that you're going to have right. to be on to make that surgery count. There was a, a spinal surgeon in, in Miami when I was going through physical therapy school uh, a long time ago who wouldn't do back surgery on a smoker unless they would quit smoking for two months prior to back surgery. Part of it was oxygen delivery to the capillary bed right. and the spine and where the surgery is going to be. But if you talk to that guy behind closed doors, it's like, no, if you don't have the psychological grit to quit smoking, right. you can't handle the rehab from the surgery that I'm doing. Because if you made it to me, you're a complicated case. And if you got the grit to lay that cancer stick down and take your health and life serious, then we're going right. to get through this together. And if you don't, yeah. I'm not your guy because you you're going to be a bad outcome. And I don't need that yeah. on my scoreboard. So, Yeah. Or why, or why are you doing it? You know, Why are you going to have this expensive surgery? If you have one fundamental part of your life, you're not taking your health. Like you're, you're knowingly, um, you know, doing something to your body that is a detriment. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think we probably should have more courageous people like that, that has the ability to tell someone, look, if you don't do X, Y, Z, you're wasting your time and money. Um, you know, I've done that with, with coaching, you know, when I was more, when I was the, the U S national coach. I had a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I want to train. I want to. And I would put them through little tests. The tests weren't to see what type of athlete they were going to be. I was testing to see what if they were committed or not, because I'm going to be investing a lot of my time into you. And if you're not willing to take it serious, then you're wasting both of our times. Slater Trout's a prime example. You know, Slater's uh, he's kind of an Instagram model now, but that kid was the most committed kid I've ever seen. And, you know, he went through some of Mark's pr programs at Exos and I did a lot of his paddling, but he lived with me for six, for six weeks. I remember we had to talk about race. him, uh, but, yeah. but yeah, I was, I was very impressed by some of the things you were telling me about the level of dedication. And yeah. I mean, the guy could be a magazine model. He had every reason yeah. in the world to lay in a hammock and look pretty and chose yeah. not to. And he's doing that now, which, you know, we're all, <laughs> you know we all move on. But if somebody you know, paid me to lay in a hammock and look pretty, I'd do it. Yeah, he slept in an air mattress in my house for six weeks. Okay, now you're committed. Now we can both put our full effort in. And, you know, maybe that's an extreme example, but maybe we need to have some of those same type of mentality of like, look, if you're not willing to adjust your sleep, you coming to see me as a, you know, as a personal trainer or a, a you know, physical therapist, if you're not willing to address your sleep, you're wasting your time. Right. You know, you're, you're wasting my time. You know, we need to be a little bit more courageous of asking those questions and at least giving them direction. Like if you don't do X, Y, Z, you're not helping yourself. The functional movement screen is your baseline. And now it is easier than ever to get certified by signing up for one of our live virtual courses. We offer FMS level one and two virtual courses online guided by a live instructor who will take you through the entire process. You'll be able to ask our team questions in real time and watch instructors work with live models throughout the day to be sure you leave with a clear understanding and ability to start implementing the FMS into your own practice. And for a limited time, we'd like to offer our podcast listeners a special rate for this FMS virtual experience. Follow the link in the show notes and use promo code VERT22 at checkout for $50 off virtual FMS level one or level two certification courses. That's V-I-R-T-2-2. And if you bundle them at checkout, you'll save an additional $120 automatically. We look forward to you joining us. Now back to the show. For our listeners, if they want to see exactly some of the stuff me and you did with Indian Clubs, which isn't our classic Indian Clubs course, that is honoring the turning of the clubs. 
and it used to be a freaking Olympic sport. Most people don't remember that. Right. But what I did with you is on YouTube right now. It's exploring Indian yep. clubs. It's me and Brett Jones. And it's like five segments that you can use as a self-awareness drill. And if it cleans you up, I would say let that or let that segment of clubs, that that stepping routine or that turning routine be your warm up. Um, don't necessarily come at this with lit up back pain, thinking that you can have that experience that me and you had, because right. I checked a lot of boxes before we went there. But at the same right. time, I've used that awareness drill in groups. I did it uh, with a camp at Power Monkey Fitness a while ago for people who are very, very fit, still showing them there's a general wash that would help you. And I just did it at a rehab clinic with a bunch of people that sat and listened to me lecture for an hour and a half. And I'm like, hey, I'm ADHD too. Let's get up and move for a minute. And yeah. we did the clubs. And people who think they don't have a balance uh, problem or a T-spine rotation problem, the minute you got an extra pound in each hand and you're just doing these ballistic movements, you really do find those park and breaks. And the neat thing is, most of the time, that park and break is there for no reason at all. That was a previous right. injury or a previous ping or a previous thing that caused you to hold your breath. And I've told a lot of people this. I'm like, you know, you can't turn to the left. Well, I've noticed that. And in, in, when they used to make maps, like before we knew the world was round, we thought it was flat. If there was an unexplored area, they would always have a dragon at the end saying dragons be there because we haven't been right, there, so, right, right? right? Well, there's a dragon over your left shoulder, and I don't know what happened. Right. You could have got rear-ended as you were backing out of your driveway or something, but a lot of us get hurt. We forget the position we were hurt in. Well, your right. body doesn't, and so sometimes no. we build that breathing muscle tone barrier and if there's no sign of inflammation that's, that's active and you just got this tightness somewhere, there's a good chance it's a park and break that you've forgotten to release and an episode you've gotten to let go of because it blindsides you so bad, you forget that it's there. You feel the tightness. Right. So you're always looking for the foam roll or the ball to crush in there or the place to floss. Right. That's not it. You got to breathe your way through this. That's a psychological barrier and you can't press tissue through a psychological barrier. And so they work together, clean up the tissue. Right. You still won't make the turn because there's a dragon there, but we can back off, cycle a breath, turn a little right. deeper, back off. And every time you cycle that deep breath or sink that breath with your movement, you tell your body, this is okay. This is right. okay. My brother told me a story one time. You got the crying baby. Mom gets upset. He'd lay the crying baby on his chest and he said, I either going to match your breathing or you're going to match mine. And right, so he right. would breathe slower. Pretty soon the baby's listening to the way he's breathing, not a word right. he's saying. So it's, it's neat to, to meet people at that breath bias and help them through right. it. And, and it's, it's truly rewarding. And you don't have to be a specialist to do that, but you've got to check the boxes of safety. And then you got right. to offer something in a playful and non-performance way. And a lot of times we teach right. exercise only in a performance way, not in a therapeutic right. way. So Right. Yeah, no, it's it's good. Yeah, the, the one thing I noticed just going through the the uh, Indian Club progression with with Brett Jones is when he started playing with some of the asymm asymmetrical stance, you know, the single leg stance. You know, you're almost kind of inclined to, as you're watching the videos, to play around with it. I'm like, man, it's amazing how, you know, I could be out surfing, you know, and not think that I have a balance issue at all. But you come in here and you start doing single leg stance, you're like, oh, wow, I can't believe how much more stable I feel on my right leg versus my left leg. So, yeah, you're hitting the nail on the head of, you know, even someone that doesn't have back issues like I do going through that, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. And that's ultimately what you want to do is, and even, you know, I'm assuming Brett's a pretty knowledgeable guy when it comes to Indian clubs, even watching those videos and him, the light bulb going on a few times with him, you know, that had been a good experience as well for someone that's extremely versed in Indian clubs. Well, Brett and I have done so much work together on camera that a lot of times I don't tell Brett what we're going to do. So I'll get that <laughs> authentic capture. And I don't know if it's you know, but that, that whole stretch, the Bretzel, yeah, he yeah. didn't know that was coming. In our very first uh, kettlebell video, we we uh, were doing the Turkish getup, and I introduced the bretzel. Brett Jones is a pretzel. Uh, he didn't know it was coming. 
I knew Brett had tight quads. He wouldn't be as strong right. as he was if he didn't have twi- right. tight quads. And I knew he was a little right. bit locked up in the T-spine. So he wasn't mic'd. I was. I'm leaning over him. He's doing a bretzel. And we got to that <laughs> moment. <Yeah. laughs> and he didn't know a lot of that stuff was coming. And the point is, Brett's an amazing strength athlete. You're an amazing right. multi-sport athlete. So you're a good compensator. And Right. It, number when we were down in uh, Wrightsville last, and you and I were trying to meet up, and we didn't, and you told me you were going surfing, I had right. a sigh of relief because I'm like, if he's surfing, he's got to at least be fifty something right. <laughs> better. But right. yeah. my point well, is, and, and get, yeah, yeah, no, ahead, the athletes are great compensators, and the right. Indian clubs thing, like jump rope, is very self limiting. Meaning, if you can't slouch and jump rope, you can't slouch and do Indian club turns, right. and and you can't swing those clubs and be predominantly on one foot and, and not have a problem. So good athletes can always compensate through their skill, coming back to a fundamental ballistic activity that you can't compensate around means more as a physical example than reading them 10 right. research papers on their core. And and so it's yeah. very important. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and you know, the athlete thing is, is a funny is a funny business because as the older that you get you can't rely on that anymore and i think that's a lot what happened to to my lower back is i've always had you know i had lower back issues in high school once again you compensate as you you know in paddling paddling can be very strenuous on shoulders and lower back compensate but at some point you're going to run out of the ability to compensate and sometimes that happens earlier for people you know maybe the non athlete but the athlete at some point is going to run out of the ability to compensate. And that's when, you know, you see guys like, you know, who was the running back for Texas that you saw him in his late fifties, uh, Earl Campbell, I think it was, you see him in his late fifties and the guy can barely walk. Yep. It's like he compensated his whole life. And you're like, man, you just, you know, you just feel bad for that guy that he's in his late fifties, early sixties, and he can barely walk. You know, I remember seeing videos of him, you know, that might've been 10, 15 years ago. Be like, okay, is this really worth it? Is compensating or putting your body through that? So I think at some point, you know, you got to have that come to Jesus moment of, you know, for me, it was the learning process of going through that kettlebell uh, progression with you. It really opened my eyes. And then it started to open my eyes with other stuff that I've either forgotten or I've compensated for. Yep. So it's, you know, it's pretty phenomenal. Well, I'm going to do a shameless plug for the the movement book do here because that's going to take us to our next place. But uh, I think it's on page 50. Labeling someone as fit should imply fit for blank. Does this person have the physical capacity to withstand and thrive against the stress of the environmental um, obstacles that they're getting ready to face? Right. And so using the word fitness without an environmental imperative or an obstacle right. is really just another way to sell a product or service that doesn't have any accountability attached to it. Because right. if I say fit for combat, then there's a few things we've got to do. And, and when Lee Burton was getting his PhD, he was stacking the movement screen up against something in the fire service that was a pretty good predictor of how you're going to function as a young firefighter. And that's the obstacle course. We didn't base your career right. on how many pull-ups or sit-ups or how fast you could run. It was the multi-dimensional obstacle engagement of getting through right. an obstacle course. A good runner that can still climb gets through. A good climber that can still run gets through. And my whole point is, the FMS lined up very nicely with the obstacle course, but the obstacle course didn't say one activity can be good enough to be subpar in another activity. You right. gotta bring right. you gotta bring, you know, average to everything and you can be exceptional in a few, but you can't bring below average to anything and then have one exceptional and survive right. true life. And right. So when, when you transitioned, I guess, your career into paddle fit, thank God you put paddle in front of it because you weren't just showing people how to make themselves tired paddling. You were actually taking probably more of a functional approach to paddling and training paddle coaches 
than I had seen anybody else do. And I, I commend you for that right. because Greg Rose did a, did a pretty good functional pass into golf. And I right. made an attempt to do that when some of my early work in tennis. And not all your exercises look like paddling. Not all right. Greg's exercises Very, look like golf, you know, and that's you're, important. You're not going to, yeah, you're not going to find a single exercise that I do that looks like paddling. Because if you want to get better at paddling, guess what you got to do? You go paddle. If you want to build a foundation to make you a better paddler, that's a separate conversation. And that's, and that's what I base the entire paddle fit program on. We've got to make you the best athlete. I'm going to use that term as a generality. We're going to make you the best athlete. That's going to be making sure that you have no discrepancies. You have no asymmetries, you know, where the FMS, where the FMS screen comes in. And then we got to build that foundation on you being the best human you can be. And then we can start talking about paddling. And then we can start talking about technique. Because what I found, and this was early on, and I had already bought, I had already drank the FMS Kool-Aid, the functional movement Kool-Aid at this point. But what I saw is people having physical limitations to their paddling technique as opposed to a knowledge issue. Right. You know. They could know, okay, we got to keep that bottom arm relatively straight, but they had a physical limitation that prevented them from doing that. So, you know, taking them off the board, and you and I have had many conversations, taking them off the board, giving them a corrective, putting them back on, then asking them to do the technique that you're looking for is far more effective than beating them out over the head with technique or in, in trying to mimic the paddle stroke which I've, you know, there's no way you can mimic the paddle stroke. Just get on the board and go, let's work on the other stuff before that. No, I, I, I really like that. Now I'm going to ask you a question that's probably, now, if you're into paddle sports, if you're into water culture, this is the part of this podcast where Lee doesn't get to be here. He doesn't get to stop me. I'm a water sport junkie and I've been that all my life. My dad was a hardworking Methodist minister, but when he would take a day and we would just get on a river in a canoe. That was as close to heaven as I've ever been. I got my Absolutely. dad, I got my sky, I got a few rapids in front of us and we're probably going to wreck this thing. And that's all so <laughs> absolutely cool to me. But yeah. all right, when, if we use stand up paddleboard as one of the, I think it's a, it's such an authentic activity. Number one, your visual perspective is completely different than anything else you do. It's way more rhythmical than surfing. You know, I would put surfing right. closer to skateboarding and stand up paddleboarding Correct. a little bit closer to paddle sports. But you got two people that generally are going to come to stand up paddling right away. And that's going to be your surfers are going to grab a paddle and your paddlers are going to grab a board. Talk to both of those and some of the general obstacles where somebody who's got that great foot connection enough to surf comes to paddling and has to get stroke mechanics as opposed to somebody who's been sitting working on paddle mechanics and now has to get on their feet. So right. give me both those scenarios. Yeah. I mean, you have, you have two polar opposite mentalities, you know, you even look at Laird Hamilton and Dave Kalama, who I would consider the modern inventors of stand up paddling. Stand up paddling has been around. I mean, I've seen pictures of turn of the century Israeli lifeguards on a, I forgot the name of the board that they're on, but they're on this huge board and they're paddling a double bladed paddle standing up. Mm -hmm. So you've had stand up paddling forever, but the modern two guys are Laird and Dave and Laird and Dave are, are definitely from the surfing side of it. And they did it as a part of uh, the ability to be able to train be on the water because their affinity for the water. So they're like, man, I got to figure out this, the surf's terrible today. I got to figure out how to get in the water, you know, and Dave did some windsurfing and they did some kiting, but they both gravita gravitated towards stand up paddling because there was an adventure part of it. You know, they could go out and maybe go to that peak that, that on a terrible surf day, that peak is then breaking, but it was just inaccessible. Right. So that really tied in the exploration. So you've got that camp and then you've got the other camp that have, you know, they've been sitting in a kayak and I was this person, I was a, kayaker growing up in Michigan before I was ever a surfer, you know, and you got monkey butt, your butt itches because you're sitting down and, you know, <laughs> your back hurts because you're, 
because you're hunched over and you know stand up paddling is like and then your legs I'm go gonna numb. try this and then your legs go numb. I mean all this stuff I had to sit on top kayak way before I had to stand up paddleboard and I just remember like man this is great but I can only do this for like 45 minutes and I want to just jump out and kill myself because my lower back's on fire my butt's itchy you know I just so you have those two different camps and they're coming at it from a way different perspective I was fortunate enough that I was, I kind of had a foot in both of those realms. I grew up, you know, kayaking rivers in Michigan and canoeing rivers. And then I had, um, you know, once I moved to San Diego, when I, when I made the career transition, transition from wildlife biology into, um, fitness, I moved to San Diego and got in that surf culture. And then I really didn't start staying up paddling until 07, 06 or 07 when I moved to Hawaii. But I was very fortunate to have a foot in both of those. So I could appeal to that kayaker that's like, oh, what's this new sport about? And I could also appeal to the surfing community that's like, you know what? I really don't like you guys in the lineup, but I don't know what to do on the three or four days a week that we don't have surf. So I'm going to give it a try. So I was very fortunate to be able to sit in both of those camps because they are two different mentalities. Well, I think that also helped you communicate really quick where the bottleneck Correct. is here. and. There are two movement patterns that I want everybody who's working with paddlers or who is a paddler, regardless of the style of, of water sport you do. There's two movement patterns I need you to own. You got to own your deep squat, and that's heels flat, right. ass to grass. And if you don't have it, start working on it. And you got to yep. own your toe touch. And if yep. you're missing that fundamental hinge, and people are going to say, well, where in paddle sports do you deep squat? Well, Surfers without a deep squat really lose that center of gravity advantage that a deep squatter has. And no, it's never perfectly symmetrical, but you don't need any rocks in that road on the way to the deep squat. You need to have an right. effortless drop, get low. And you also have to have an organized hip hinge that doesn't require to around your back. And I don't need to name names, but how many people have you seen distinguish yourself in stand up paddleboarding? with the worst rounded back you've ever seen in your life and you'd never let anybody do one deadlift in that position and yet they just finished three hours in that position right yeah <laughs> some of the top some of the top paddlers on the planet whether you know the the sport as a competitive sport's been here for 15 plus years but the early on there were so many of the top paddlers that you're like how does that person even walk once they reach the beach They've got to be in so much pain. And then you had guys in the other end of the spectrum. You had the Danny Chings of the world and Dave Kalamas who were, I mean, you'd be like, man, if, if you could can how good your form is and how good your biomechanics are from just a human standpoint and pass that to everybody, the whole world would be a lot better. So, well, yeah, the, the early on there were some bad, bad posture uh, people that you're, you wondered how they function as a human. Well, from the very first time they started making stand-up paddleboard magazines and websites, they've been coming to me. And I did notice Danny and uh, Dave. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I, I don't really – function and form go hand in hand. And you couldn't chisel a better, better paddle body because I'm not saying they're short-legged, but they're a little bit more torso than leg, right? Yeah, correct. Right? Well yeah. – there's, there's a, that's a competitive advantage in golf too. I mean, if you look at the Jack right. Nicholas body, long torso, shorter legs, but they didn't have serious mobility problems either. So they are built sort of compact, meaning there's a lot of ways you could be their height and not have a long torso or shorter legs, but arms are sort of long. So if they'd sort of grown up in a deadlifting culture, they'd have been good there too, you know? Yeah. So well, they're, it, yeah, they're already built to turn and hinge at the same time, but they honored that with feeding better technique onto that. And so when you do have the long legged, short torso, not long arm person, they can round their back and they can get away with it. And sometimes they can beat one of those guys, but here's the problem. Not in their thirties. They can't only in their, yeah. in your twenties, you can get away with late nights, bad sleep, more alcohol right. than you need, and bad right. mechanics. 
not in your thirties. You can't. <laughs> so. yeah. and, and what you're describing is the people that didn't have that, you know, good quality or not, I shouldn't say quality, you know, the prototypical good paddler physique, almost every single one of them were compensating in some form or fashion. Like you said, the, the tall, the long legged long torso, those people were equally as a disadvantage than the short torso, long legs or short torso, short legs. Those are the people that you saw a video of and you're like, oh my goodness, they're not going to be able to sustain that. And it was true for yeah. a lot of them. It was true. And, and you don't, you yeah. don't want to call it. And, and, and I don't blame their, their coaches, their therapist or anybody, because when you're in the heat of battle, you got to work with what you got. But if there ever is an off season or there ever is a slight injury or incident, that's a teaching moment for me. That's when I'm like, right. win how you got to win. We're all athletes, but all right. If the pressure's not on, what part of this do we work on? Early in his career, Tiger Woods retooled his swing at the top of his game because I think he realized right. it wasn't sustainable. And we look back now, right. I think he was already feeling the pain of a lot of the injuries he had oh, surgery yeah, from. Man. Right, right. So, you know, retooling is, is what all great athletes uh, do. I, I just watched a thing on Netflix about uh, facing Nolan, Nolan Ryan. Um, yeah. Oh, my God. If, if, if he wasn't this larger than life hero before that, watching that story unpacked and some of the obstacles he faced, uh, that's grit and athleticism in its finest over what a 30 year career, I think. It's right. Like, right. It's sick. Right. Uh, so, so well, watch that next time you need to kick your old ass in the butt. <laughs> so. that's, good. that's good. So I, I have a, a story. So one of the, the key things in paddling is efficiency. Whether you're, you know, a stay-at-home mom going for a cruise after you drop the kids off or you're a, a top paddle athlete, efficiency is always what it comes down to. And I remember overhearing a conversation between one of the top paddlers, who I won't mention, talking with Danny Ching, who has a very efficient stroke, and him, the, the one paddler who is a world champ, having the conversation going, I wish I was as efficient as you because for every one stroke that you take, I have to take three to keep up with you. And I thought that that was a fascinating conversation because the person who had what I would consider poor form, even though they're super fast, was already recognizing someone who had really good form, who was equally as fast. They were just more efficient. So it was a real, to, to me, that was a light bulb moment. And that happened probably 2010, 2011. When I overheard that conversation, I'm like, Oh, so they're starting to recognize, even though that person hadn't experienced injuries yet, they, they, they realize like, if I don't change and become more efficient, this is probably what's going to happen to me. You know, they're almost predicting their own future. Well, what you just described to me is something that I want our pro listeners to hear. If you've been blessed by our creator with a really good metabolism, you're probably yeah. going to exploit your musculoskeletal system. And if yeah. you've been blessed with a great musculoskeletal system, Danny, you know, then right. you're going to have to learn to make your metabolic system better. So you right. can't cheat either one. You got to feed your metabolic system, good energy sources, but make sure that energy is efficient coming back out because a hundred percent of your energy is coming back out. 30% of it may be in sheer force, tissue tearing right. <laughs> and bad right. mechanics, but it's all coming right. out. I, in in right. my very first book, Athletic Body and Balance, I refer to those as energy leaks. The energy's coming out, but what part of your car leaking is good? None of it. And so, None of it. you know, you're breaking traction, you're, you're not efficient. So you're either going to have a great movement screen and you're going to have to learn to take care of your metabolism better, rest, stress recovery, better nutritional right. sources, or you're going to be blessed with this unbelievable grind. You're just looking for another marathon, but guess right. what? Tendonitis, arthritis, low back pain, hernia, yep. tendon rupture. So you know, a movement screen and a metabolic screen can tell you your weakest link, or you can just wait right. six months and life will tell right. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's that's, I mean, that's why something like FMS is critical because as a professional, you want to, you want to hopefully mitigate that person from going through any type of injury. You know, I mean, that's why 
I think it was, was it the Indianapolis Colts that you guys did a, your one of your seminal studies that you know they didn't was it they didn't allow someone on the field that was below a fourteen and yep. they was that was yeah John John made that call and as a strength coach um, he stuck his neck out but but let right. me let me say this John didn't trust Gray Cook right John here's what he did um, we did a FMS workshop for all of the strength coaches and athletic trainers who could attend, sponsored by Reebok, down at the Boletary Tennis Academy in Bradenton. And that's right after Mark Verstegen was down there. And, and Reebok said, what can we do to really make an uh, impression on the NFL? And I'm like, let's give them a movement screen workshop. I'll show them the core board and stuff like that. John was the strength coach that didn't get to come. He was doing something else at the time. So right. he was the one person that took the FMS manual and went by the book, but he didn't take it to say Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison. He worked on the practice right. squad and he literally did his reps on the practice squad. These guys were glad to be getting attention from the head strength coach because they rarely got to see John. They were working with somebody else or working on their own. John was movement screening them and then watching their movement change and then seeing what that meant in their performance. So he's looking at performance, but he's messing with movement. John had a year of reps under his belt and full respect from the, the GM and, and Tony Dungy, the head coach at the time. So when John made that call, they're like, yeah, it's your call. You're, you know. Yeah, and so right. I, I want people to know, John didn't make that call based on the research or what I said. Right. John did way more reps than any other strength coach in the league at that time with, he didn't trust me, he tested me. Right. And, right. and developed his own sort of appraisal of that. And he set the bar and then the research came out and then right. he did it with the starters. So no, nobody should read our book or take our course and then go, you know, nail something on the door and saying, this is where it is. Right. I want you to test us and see how we fit in your environment. But right. what, what we are is we can show you bottlenecks in the organism, but that doesn't right. mean that the organism caused these. Sometimes the environment right. did, sometimes the organism right. did, but here's a bottleneck. You're about, I don't know, 30 minutes of good analysis away from figuring out what's the weakest link here, the way they're living or what life has done to them. And we've got to unstick them right now. So. Right. Right. Yeah. But I thought, you know, that was fascinating that, you know, you had real, real world proof of, I don't even want to call it preventative, but just screening those people out and, and giving them a tool. And that's obviously on the highest level because that year they, that next year they won the Super Bowl, correct? Yep. Yep. So, for, for nine you know, years, he fielded one of the lightest teams in the NFL and had the least injuries of any team in the NFL. And believe it or not, posted the most wins of any team in the NFL for nine years. Problem is, there was another team called the Patriots with Belichick and Brady and, and they, they got more Super Bowls at the time. So when you yeah. look back at that nine year span, statistically speaking, the Colts did everything they could in any given Sunday, different stuff will happen. So that takes nothing away from Brady or Belichick, but from where John was sitting, you couldn't have done more for a team as a strength coach right. than he did. And, right. and I mean, yeah. Uh, like I said, he tested it in house. He he drove he yeah. test drove our car harder than anybody else and became an expert quicker than anybody right. else because of those reps. Yeah, so. yeah, you're telling me Phil Mickelson wouldn't have loved to have been born ten years earlier or later. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know the the Peyton Manning I'm sure would have loved to have been born ten years later, ten years earlier. You know, right. you're going up against one of the best ever. But for the fitness professionals out there. The proof is what John did is he did everything in his possible, you know, in his, his ability to do his job, which is not only make the team stronger, but keep them healthy and keep them, keep those players on the field. I'm sure, you know, once again, I've never been in those meetings, but if I'm an NFL coach or a GM and I hire a strength coach, you're like, your job is to keep our players on the field and being as strong as they can. So, you know, from that standpoint, he did his job. It just, you know, it was a bummer that you're going up against the greatest quarterback and team probably to ever exist. So you can't control that. You can only control 
um, you know, what John was able to, and, and that's, it's remarkable for sure. Well, he, he controlled everything he could. And, and like yep. I said, he's probably been, uh, consulting with more pro sports, uh, right. than, than most any other, not just in football. Right. Right. Just because of the way he ran that room, because of the way he set up a culture, a lot of his interns never went to football. They pivoted and went to right. MLB. And so right. John Terrine has a lot, <laughs> a lot of interns in a lot of different right. sports right now. Um, so yeah, yeah that this, did, did we say this was the John Terrine show? I mean, it could have been, no, we I, should I'm, get him on next time. Well, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> We, we don't need George Costanza on this show because that, yeah, that's, no, that's my that's right. pet name for him. But let's go in, back into paddling a little bit more. I'm going to make a call right now that I think stand-up paddleboarding could help anyone in water sports because it's probably more of a warm climate alternative. But if you're in a kayak or a canoe or some other seated paddling thing like rowing, sculling, crew, I honestly think it's a great contrast. I also have witnessed through my contacts with golf and Titleist that a lot of golfers have migrated to using stand-up paddleboard as their way to maybe get away from the crowd when they're at a location. Most, most good golf courses are not too far from water. And so I've used, I've seen people use it as a cross training alternative and also a way to stay involved in the water, but do something a little different. So I think stand up paddleboarding can really contrast a lot of the impact or high velocity sports you can do for the same reason that I think carries can make you stronger. Postural integrity under control. You are running a balance algorithm and a propulsion algorithm at the exact same time. And so the, when I see people go to the Club Med and get the paddleboard rental and get the lesson, and the first thing these damn people do is they stand up on a paddleboard and try not to fall. And right. I, you really helped me think through this because if we're going to take a functional approach to paddling, I need you to lay on that board and show me you can propel the board with your arms. Good. Now lay on the board and show me you can pro propel the board with your legs. Good. Okay. Worst case scenario, you can get back to shore. We've covered that. Right. Now let's do something in kneeling and in half kneeling, not because stand up paddle boarding needs to have that, but there's also a functional reason to get down out of the wind, but taking you off your feet makes you use your core and your catch, that catch, that first purchase of the paddle on water in a much more amplified way. If you go through lying, maybe sitting, kneeling, and half kneeling, and then you stand, you're a completely different person on the board than if the first time you get on that board, you just stand and try to pull on a paddle. Because you're either not going to go anywhere, or you're going to pull yourself off the board. So Right. Well, I mean, you just hit kind of our teaching progression for getting to our feet. Um, you know, we start in half kneeling. I mean, obviously you have to get on your board to whether you're getting on a dock or off the beach or whatever, but our first, uh, teaching point is from half kneeling or tall kneeling, either one, depending on how comfortable they are. And I always tell people like, look, the general population are dumpster fires. If they're not, <laughs> if they can't control the board when they're in half kneeling or tall kneeling, what do you think is going to happen when they get on their feet? It's, you know, is it going to get better? No, it's not because it's more difficult. So that is our progression. You, you know, start on with tall kneeling. If you can control the board, if you can engage, you know, your core to be able to propel the board forward and your arms are working in conjunction. Well, great. Then we can go after you getting to your feet because now once you get into your feet, balance is a component as well as core engagement, stability, mobility, all this, the fun stuff that we like to talk about. So, so absolutely. Go ahead. So no, not only getting a, a novice standing with some degree of integrity and, 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 and right. functionality, but how many pros have you dropped down to left knee down or right knee down? Right. And it's a whole different day. They're like, oh my God, yeah. 
I got I got yeah. 300 strokes on the right, 30 strokes yeah. into the left. I'm cramping. I'm done. I, I feel yep. awkward. My balance is compromised. But my whole point is, slow down. Let's breathe our right. way through it. We either got to do a corrective to get you in a better position, or we got to figure out a different way to do this. So right. in every situation, you got to fix the posture before you fix the pattern. Because if you start the right. pattern with a bad posture, it's like starting the golf swing with a bad backswing. You can't correct it on the fly. Yeah. So correct. the movement screen literally runs through a lot of postures and patterns. But if you realize that somebody can't get tall half kneeling, then I don't know, stretch their quad, stretch their hip flexor, get their right. T-spine mobility, or just teach them how to breathe. Right. And you got a nice sandy beach right there. We could do some half right. kneeling. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of that, especially the the more advanced you get in our coaching program. We do start to integrate some of those. And it's, you know, it's really fascinating that, you know, some of our lower uh, lower level coaches aren't necessarily fitness professionals, but they're able to implement, like, can anybody do a quad stretch? Yeah, you can do a quad stretch. That's going to help you get in tall kneeling or half kneeling. And guess what? You're going to have a better paddle experience. And you might not even talking about fitness or talking about paddle and fitness, but you can integrate some of those stuff to, uh, to get your clients to do what you want them to do. I want to go back to a couple things you said. Okay. So when you, when you break apart the, the paddle stroke, it is eerily similar to the golf swing. So in paddling, you're obviously trying to propel the board forward. In golf, you're obviously trying to hit the ball perpendicular to your stance. But it is eerily similar when you start breaking apart the golf swing and the paddle stroke. So I think, I mean, I have no empirical evidence to back this up, but I think a lot of golfers like Davis Love the Third is a huge paddle boarder. I know that, yes. I, I believe that those guys, the ones that were kinesthetically aware of their own body, realize that, Hey, if I spend some time paddling, it's going to help with my golf swing. And it's like you said, I'm gonna be able to get away from the crowds. I'm gonna be able to shut that off. So I think it's fascinating to see that. And then, um, on the, one of the other points about, you know, some pro athletes using it as cross training. I used to work with John Carney when I, when I lived in San Diego, he had his top punters and kickers camp out there. And he would call me up and be like, Hey Brody, we want to get a paddle day just so these guys can decompress and, and do a different workout as opposed to, you know, kicking 400 balls with their right leg <laughs> and, uh, you know, having hip flexor issues and all the other stuff you get with kicking. So I would take those guys out and it's amazing how they would shut their brain off and they would just go paddle and, and, and they would get a good workout in. Obviously you've got core activation, you've got all the other fun stuff. So it is, to your point, a hugely beneficial cross training because you're not beating your body up like you are running. You're not beating your body up like, you know, any type of high intensity exercise. You're able to shut your mind off, which is equally as important, especially for those pro athletes. You know, they've been they think about 100 percent of what they do all day long. When you're on the water, it's almost impossible to think about anything other than paddling because it requires that much of your attention. So, you know, I think you bring up those two key points about golf and about cross training that I've observed over the last 15, 20 years of, of being involved in the sport. It's pretty remarkable. No, I think it's great. So if you're not into water sports, this is, this is as holistic and functional as I can recommend because you are on your feet. They do make boards and paddles that are extremely forgiving I would right. recommend flat water paddle boarding before I would recommend 100%. surfing, unless you are into surfing and need a different medium to do right. that. But it is such a fun place for Indian clubs and paddle boarding are two places that are untapped that people that I work with know so little about. We can just get right. over all the sets and reps bullshit and get right yeah. into, you can't disengage from either of these activities. And full engagement yeah. is where mind and body do get to connect. And, and I've brought yeah. some breathing sequences to paddling, not for performance reasons, okay? Right. But, but for corrective reasons, realizing that if I do have a just really efficient catch and stroke on one side and just not quite as good on the other, then I'm like, well, what's the difference in my breathing? Because I, right. I don't need to be thinking about – I don't have Brody paddling beside me right now, so I don't know right. how crappy I look. 
but I do right. know that this is a different way of breathing. And one of the breathing sequences that anybody interested in paddling, I want them to think about is when you reach to catch the water, exhale. And when right. you go to pull yourself back into more of an erect posture with those nice arms and, and, and create that propulsion, make an inhale. Some people might disagree with me saying you should exhale on the exertion because that's how we shot put in discus. But I'm not talking about winning a race right now. Your breathing pattern right. at race pace needs to be coached by you and your coach. What I'm talking right. about is when you're trying to level the, the pelvis and the core and make your uh, stroke symmetrical, I did the same thing with your Indian clubs. I actually made the breathing inhale on your spinal extension. And that goes back into right. the, the breathing course that we did with Kyle Kiesel. And if we want to uh, bypass the bullshit that your core accumulates by slouching and sitting right. and lounging a lot, then that instantaneous inhale upon spinal extension actually makes you use less core dysfunction or what I could say more functional activation without thinking right. about it. Because I don't want you thinking right. about your core, but if you breathe, right. uh, inhale, then you're not at race pace. You're at about 60, 70% of that. But inhale on the catch and pull and exhale on the reach and watch your bad side get a lot more like your good side. And right. please don't comment on this until you try it twice <laughs> because yeah, exactly. we don't have to, we don't have to discuss it. It's right. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. But I had to yeah, figure it out the hard way. You got to have a right. dysfunctional side before you can really litmus test that. But once you can, right. it's as simple as breathing. You don't have to read right. a biomechanics article yet. Right. And I it. think that, I think that nine, just like in, in real life, 90% of paddlers probably have a strong side, weak side, a, stri a side that they've got better form on. You know, I, I, there was a time when I was heavy into competing in stand up paddling that I, that would change on a weekly basis. You know, I would wake up and go do my paddle training and be like, why does my left side feel weird today? And then you get the next, you know, you go train tomorrow and you're like, okay, my right side's not feeling good. So, you know, just like in real life, things change and getting back to fundamentals, like you're talking about breathing, setting that pelvis floor and, and, and doing things like that is just really beneficial. Then you can start building upon that and, um, you know, maybe adjust your breathing if you're in race pace or what have you. Well, one of the things I'd like to wrap this with, and, and you can freestyle on this as long as you want, but one of the metaphors that I, that has always humbled me is when I first started taking this functional approach, I was watching my first daughter learn to walk and I'm like, I'm Gray Cook. Um, I'm already recognized as a specialist in strength conditioning and, and orthopedic physical therapy and sports medicine. And I can't add a thing to this beautiful child right. learning to walk. I can provide her with a safe environment and a bunch of hugs and kisses, but I can't do this for her, nor should I. Okay. She's got to learn to stand. And um, how many times in life do you get to learn to stand again? And when right. we hand you a big old fat surfboard and you get to learn to stand again, don't turn this into an exercise or an adventure. Be humbled right. and learn right. to stand. And you'll be so surprised how quick you get good if you humble yourself and kneel <laughs> and lay and sit and compare the yeah. left to right and learn to breathe. So, you know, for those people who may just be hearing this for the first time and you want to try it, try it the way Brody's talking about it. Go right. find the paddle fit coach, go find Brody right. on the web and just, I, I just, how many times do you get to learn to stand up again and maybe right. clean up some of the integrity issues you've had. Every other form of exercise is let's let's go do battling ropes until we puke and let's go climb right. this rock and see if, you know, but but just go learn to stand on water. Um because the earth doesn't challenge you anymore. You're already compensating, but the water, the board won't let you compensate. Get a big old fat tugboat and half kneel on it. Yeah. You don't need a race board to half kneel on. No. Uh, get an inflatable. That way, if you fall on it, you don't get a concussion. But um, 
a lot of people who are looking for a way to maybe continue being fit during the next pandemic or the next warm weather season. Right. Grab a paddle, grab a board, do the developmental approach. Don't take a metabolic approach to paddling. Take right. a developmental approach to paddling and uh, become a water person in, in the right way. And by the way, you were talking about the stand-up paddleboarding. It just occurred to me, I live in, in, in uh, Southern Virginia, and the way they used to get tobacco to most of the Eastern markets so we could ship it yeah. back over to England and get them addicted to nicotine too, was we would have these long bateaus, these big wooden boats. They would yeah. pull those. So I yeah. honestly think we've been pulling boats as long as we've been paddling oh, boats. Yeah. And you pull a boat standing up and you put yeah. a fat end on it. And now it's a paddle. But standing on water has been something that I think we've all been attracted to. I mean, Jesus could do it without yeah. a boat or a paddle, but yeah. the rest of us need a little bit of equipment. But let's not make it all about the equipment. Let's make it about learning to stand uh, and, and run with that for a minute because I, I well, want I, people to be I able just, to find I, you. Yeah, I've got two closing thoughts. One is, for me, stand-up paddling is kind of full circle from my wildlife biology background. Because, you know, wildlife biology, if you're a biologist, your whole goal is to take care of the environment, the natural environment. Um, I think so much of our planet has been neglected because people don't have a connection with it. If you sit in a car to commute, go sit behind a desk, sit back in your car, commute home stay in your house, you never interact with the outside, never interact with being on water, you're, gonna, you're not going to care about what happens to the environment and you're not going to have a relationship with it. So stand-up paddling has done that for so many people. You know, there, we always joke at PaddleFit that we're, you know, our slogan should be getting people to quit their careers since, you know, 20, 2009 because <laughs> as soon as you have that connection with the environment, it changes everything. So if we're really trying to get healthy as a species, we have to be able to in interact with our environment. That's one aspect. And the other aspect about, about being on the water and, and specifically standing on the water, you talk to any big wave surfer, surfer, stand-up paddler, the water is a humbling medium, okay? If you interact with even a river, a lake, whatever it is, or two, you know, 20-foot waves, you will be humbled at some point. And I think that that is a great equalizer. If you allow yourself to be humbled, it's going to make you a better person. And the water is a great medium for that. You know, to this day, I'll go out in the water and I've been surfing forever and I'll still have a bad day surfing. I'm like, guess what? You got humbled today. So I think to bring it full circle, get out on the board. Like you said, learn to stand again. We always say, be a man, learn to stand. Uh, we say that to the surfers, uh, or you can be a woman and learn to stand. Um, but it's a great way to challenge yourself. And if you want to take it to the extreme and do high intensity workouts or become a racer, great. But like you said, become developmental with it. Learn how to kneel, learn how to stand. It's a phenomenal sport. And I'm just thankful to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right people like you and Lee and, and FMS and some of the other people in the, in the paddling world. So it's a great sport, and I'm very thankful for the opportunities that it's provided. No, we're, we're thankful to have you. We're thankful to have Paddle Fit, and I'm glad you actually define Paddle Fit by the environment and the organism, not just one way, because fitness right. ain't just in a box. It's, it's no. navigating the earth. And the one thing I learned when I was training for marathon canoe races is a lot of times we train upstream. Sometimes we train downstream. And both right. are good. When you're going upstream, you learn to stay out of the current and make some headway. And right. there's a time in your oh, career yeah. where you better lay low <laughs> and just right. do what you can. And there's a time in life when you got to find that current and realize that nature's giving you uh, shoots and ladders and you get a competitive right. advantage. So, you know, I love training upstream. I love training downstream. The difference is you right. got to know where the current is either way. Stay out of it sometimes, get in at other times. And uh, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's that. So, but So many life analogies from being on the water. Water. So many life analogies. It is. It is. And uh, anyway, brother, thank you. Uh, we're going to do this again. And uh, if you don't get past that other 50% on the back, you got as many Grey Cook vouchers as you need yeah. because I need another paddle lesson and I'll help you with your back in the process. You, so. you need me back on so I can tell my idea story, which we won't do it now because it's a doozy. I, I was asked never to come back to present to idea ever again. 
<laughs> so it's a great for those fitness professionals out there. I took my one, you know, like Eminem, I had my one shot and I took it and it was a wrong approach, but we'll talk about that at another time. We will. I can't wait to hear that. All right. We might have to censor it, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's pretty clean, but I definitely took the wrong approach. <laughs> I've been uninvited to places too, but they were places yeah. I didn't really want to go to again anyway. So we're all good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But thanks for having me. It's been great. I wish Lee was on here. We'll get to talk to him at some point as well. I got him paddleboarding, but he's also got a fancy jet ski. And the only reason I think he picks paddleboarding over jet skiing some days is his hair looks better paddleboarding than it does it going does. 70 on a jet ski. And he's got nice hair, too. He's I'm got nice hair, mind, man. So. You can't get through one of these episodes without giving Lee some props for hair. So <laughs> Exactly. All right, man. Well, thanks, Matt. It's been good. God bless you. See you, bud. All right. Thank you, right. man. Bye. That will do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute and subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your own movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.